going to ring this afternoon. It's the first royal occasion for it's, in which it's been rung, but the change bells afterwards are going to ring all afternoon to celebrate. Yes, the serving Captain General of the Honourable Artillery Company, serving him for 64 years. And the first battalion of the Coldstream Guards from the Guard of Honour and the dismounted Household Cavalry, Lifeguards and the Blues and Royals and then representatives of the Commonwealth Services, Bangladesh and Canada, Fiji, Guyana, Jamaica, Malaysia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Seychelles, Sri Lanka, Tanzania, Uganda, all here. Lifeguard standing at attention. It's now five minutes or so before 11 o'clock. What a wonderful sound those bells can be heard all over the city of London. And this style invented by Stedman, that's why they're called Stedman Seats, of not having bells, the 12 bells, not having them ring 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 to 12, but going back and forward, 1, 2, 3, and then back, 2, 3, 4, and changing it all the time, which is what gives this beautiful sound. As we see the first cars, and apparently a, a coach behind, whether that will have members of the world, the royal family were coming by coach, I think they probably are, there's well, so many of them coming, they've come by see, coach, rather than car. We did see some members of the royal family uh, sprawled up the valley yesterday in a coach with, with black tie windows, so we have a much bigger contingent today of members of the royal family, and I'm sure they're behind some of the state families. We will see some of the members of the royal family emerging very soon. Well, when they emerge, we will rely on you to spot them, Roya. I'll do my best. You know every one of them. Most of them. <laughs> I don't notice one thing. I thought that that little boy, George, might be brought here, like his Prince George, like, like, like his grandmother. Well, was uh, uh, she was here for her grandfather's um, jubilee, and we saw early on another touching sight. I wonder whether they would bring this little boy here so he could say, in 70, 80 years' time, he was here on this day, but apparently not. I think we have to remember that Prince George is still only eight years old. We did see him front and centre yesterday for the first time in the carriage with his very young siblings. Um, you know, that was a big, very big move for him. We did, of course, see him at Westminster Abbey for the memorial service for the Duke of Edinburgh. So I think it's a question of pacing a very young prince in the future. Mm. The robe figure of the Lord Mayor of London, greeting the Duke of Gloucester, the Duchess, the first arrivals by car, behind Prince Michael of Kent, Princess Michael of Kent and the Queen's cousin, and I think you know, we didn't see them yesterday on the balcony, but the Queen's very keen for you know, her cousins, they are still working members of the Royal Family who do a lot of the heavy lifting, and perhaps members of the Royal Family that me and my colleagues don't write about so much, and the Queen's very keen that they are at the heart of this occasion today. And there we see Zara Tyndall, uh, the Queen's granddaughter, Mike Tyndall, Charles Snowden and his son Charles. He looks rather like his father, doesn't he? Yes, very much so. On the right of, on the right of that couple now. And then the big son of Chateau and his son, who I think is now also serving with the Royal Marines. Behind them. Tindall, there we see Peter Phillips and Lord Frederick Windsor and his wife there. I don't think I've ever seen an occasion where the royal family has been sort of waiting like the congregation were waiting to get in to the church. Well, there are an awful lot of them today. I think it was interesting yesterday. You know, the, the, Her Majesty the Queen, Prince of Wales, very keen that it should only be working members of the royal family on the balcony. We're so used to seeing the wider royal family at Trooping the Colour. And today, 
bit more of a focus on more of her family. They're out in force today. So why why would she why would she want the whole family here for what is a I mean, if it was a state occasion, they wouldn't be here. In fact, they would never be at an occasion. Would they be at the coronation or something like that? Yes, yes, they would be. Here we see Prince and Princess Michael of Kent. Michael of Kent greeting, or being greeted by, I suppose one should say, the Archbishop of York there, Stephen Cottrell, the red-headed figure of the Sacristus Centre, Robert Kozak next to him. So down this long line, and this gives you an idea of the procession that we're going to see in a moment, because the whole of this procession, the royal family that are coming in now will take their seats. But when Prince Charles arrive, arrives here, the Prince of Wales, this whole procession becomes a formal process up the full length of the nave. But for the moment, it's just a good morning and welcome to the church as you might see at any parish church on a Sunday morning. There are lots of, lots of people wearing pink, Royer, which the Queen wore, didn't she, in uh, Jubilee in 77, and also in 35, I think. Rosebud pink, I hear. I wonder whether it's a special tribute that they've and we were hearing earlier earlier this week about, or earlier at the weekend, about how the Queen was very conscious about the clothes and colour that that's she wore, the pink tie as well. Yeah, that's right, and we saw something very similar to this, if you remember, at Westminster Abbey for the memorial service to His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh. How much did the Queen, the Duchess of Cornwall and the Princess Royal were all in green, they were all in Prince Philip's green uh, livery. So it's another touch and tribute to, in, to the Queen, who of course is not here today. Perhaps I should just explain this long line of clergy. The Dean of St. Paul's, who's David Ison, is the first um, person to greet people here, leading the cathedral. And then he has a canon chancellor. He has the, he's responsible for theological learning programs. They have the precentor, uh, lay canons, and then, of course, the distinguished figure of Sarah Mullally, who saw a moment ago, the Bishop of London, and the lawyer, the Chancellor, then the Archbishop of York, and then there are chaplains and sacrists and centres. It is a huge staff that uh, runs this cathedral, both on the religious side and, of course, the very practical side of keeping the building standing. And here we see Sarah Mullally and the senior members of the royal family starting to arrive. And now I think we can see the Countess of Wessex, and she looks to be in a car with her daughter, Lady Louise, and the other Wessex, and the son, James Viscount Seven. There's quite a crowd that uh, turned up. They were here, uh, well, when I got here at six o'clock, I think it was this morning, outside the cathedral, already gathering. Though it's, it's not the easiest place for the crowds to watch from. They're held right back from this forecourt. Um, with the statue there, by the way, of Queen Anne, with her back to us in the centre of Paternoster Square. Queen Anne, who was really important in getting this cathedral built when they were getting into difficulties. Here we see the Princess Royal arriving with her husband, Vice Admiral Sir Timothy Lawrence. Of course, the Princess Royal was on Horse Guards Parade yesterday, standing with Her Majesty the Queen with the Prince of Wales and Duke of Cambridge. And there behind them, the Wessexes arriving with their children, Lady Louise and James Viscount Seven. So all the children are coming of the of the other royals, in effect, and anybody over the age of 12 or 13 or so. That's right, and most of them actually grown children too. The Wessex is here. Oh, uh, the Wessex, Prince Edward it was. They just came back, I think you were talking about them, to go from going to Antigua and Barbuda and Grenada and St. Lucia and the Grenadines on behalf of Queen Mehebe. That's right, they were on a, on a tour to the Caribbean um, nice. on behalf of Her Majesty to mark her Catherine Jubilee. And they're lovely to see Lady Louise, who we've saw, seen front and centre actually at the Jubilee celebration. She was at Windsor Castle for that wonderful horse show on uh, Sunday evening a couple of weeks ago, driving His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh's carriage. And here we see Princess Eugenie, her husband Jack Brooksbank, Princess Beatrice, her husband Eduardo and Penny Moxie arriving together. And here we see the Duke of Sussex and the Duchess of Sussex 
for the first time on a public occasion with the royal family for more than two years. This is a very big moment. The Queen was absolutely determined that they should be here, and here they are. And by the sounds of it, they're a very warm reception from the grounds outside. Big cheers as Harry and Meghan arrive right here. They're greeted by the Lord Mayor, first of all, on behalf of the City of London. The Lord Mayor, incidentally, who ranks higher than anybody except the Sovereign in the city. He ranks even higher than the Prince of Wales. And so Harry and Meghan are with Harry's cousins, Eugenie and Beatrice, and I'm sure we'll see them seated with them. How long are they here for, the Sussexes? Have they just come on a fleeting visit? Um, I, my understanding is they are here really for the duration of Her Majesty's celebrations, and I believe that they will return to the United States next week. And have they, have they met the Queen since they've been here? They weren't on the balcony, were they, yesterday? They weren't, but uh, my understanding is they did return to Buckingham House yesterday to spend time with Her Majesty the Queen and possibly for a private lunch. And of course, they are here with their children, with Archie and Lilibet, who will celebrate her first birthday on Saturday. And of course, this will be the first time Her Majesty the Queen has met her great-granddaughter, Lilibet, named after her. chat of Prince Harry. Back in the royal fold for the first time in a long time and everyone looks very pleased to see him and both of them actually. Behind them, the, the emblem of the guard. They don't get their hands shaken, they stand there on duty because they're there to protect the sovereign or whoever is representing the sovereign here. And Prince Harry just monitoring and saying hello to a few members of the congregation that he probably hasn't seen for quite a long time. A lot of heads craning to watch them as they come up the aisle. interesting I think they have certainly been given a bit of a procession on their own and that is a, I think that's interesting I think that's something how much to the Queen will have probably had a hand in they haven't just walked in with other members of the royal family they have had a moment to process because all these things are choreographed carefully aren't they in that as, way and as someone close to the Queen said very recently nothing happens by chance and this is an example of that his brother on the other hand will be in the main procession with his father, the Prince of Wales, Prince William. That's right. He'll be arriving later with the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cambridge. So why would they have Prince William in the main procession and not Prince Harry? Well, originally it was going to be the Prince of Wales who was going to greet the Queen as she arrived. And so you would have the Prince of Wales, the Duke of Cambridge, the two future heirs, it's right that they would welcome the Queen and walk into the procession. Prince Harry is no longer a working member of the royal family, he stepped back from his duties, but I think Her Majesty the Queen has ensured that Harry and Meghan were front of centre there and have their own procession. These wonderful coats here, the George V coats, scarlet and gold, as this procession makes its way to the west door to await the arrival of the Prince of Wales. The verger. And then there are various dignitaries, bishops, eminent arch archbishop Nikitos Lulas, Cardinal Nichols is here. 
and then a verger, and then 22 prebendaries, six archdeacons, and two suffragan bishops. Princess usually there just whispering something to her husband, Eduardo. Princess Eugenie wrote a really lovely tribute to Her Majesty the Queen earlier this week, and she wrote a piece talking about how she very much hopes her son, August Philip, who was named second name after His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, how she hopes that her son grows up to have the kindness and patience of Granny. It was a really touching piece. Yes, I, re I read that. I read that. It was good. We don't know exactly how many people are here in the congregation. We do know that there is a gathering of faith leaders, of representatives of all the worlds, of world faiths, I should say. And here the very distinguished figures of the Honourable Corps of Gentlemen at Arms, always present at ceremonial occasions. Back to the faith leaders. The gentlemen at arms have now disappeared from our picture, but they were another of those very old corps, lining here, instituted by Henry VIII. They celebrated their 500th anniversary in 2009. They were meant originally to provide a mounted escort, so all these things have an origin, like the children of the Chapel's Royal, who we'll be hearing singing later, who were used to travel around with the king. So all these, all these elements have a significance, even though now they're purely formalities, but kept alive for ceremonies like this. The Lord Mayor waits on the steps of the west door. sword, not um, the pearl sword, but uh, his sword of state as it's called, to show his power carried everywhere he goes because it symbolizes the authority he exercises on behalf of the sovereign in the city of London. One pigeon, not aware, but great events are taking place around, hopping along the steps, hopping down the steps. There he is again, the pigeon, determined to see what's going on here. Very curious. I like that. Jubilee Overture plays, starting with a great fanfare as we now wait for the arrival of Prince Harry's brother and his father, the Prince of Wales, who represents the Queen at this event.
Massachusetts of the Cambridge Prize for Human Resources. Duke of Cambridge and the Duchess of Cambridge. I suppose we suppose to talk to the Lord Mayor. Very elegantly dressed in pale yellow. And again, interesting, these events have their formality, but also these moments of informality, just a quiet chat about what's going to happen perhaps or what's going on. But he will be in the long procession joined by the Prince of Wales later. Once again, greeted by David Eisen, the Dean of St. Paul's, his first, first important business here 10 years ago was the Queen's Jubilee in 2012, and this is his last major occasion here, the Dean of St. Paul's, the Canon Chancellor, the presenter, Paula Gooder, James Milne, the Evans. Right, long conversations here. And in the meantime, outside the procession of cars bringing the Prince of Wales. and the Duchess of Cornwall with him, of course. of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall. And the Prince now representing Her Majesty the Queen as he did at the State Open of Parliament a few weeks back. And gradually it seems taking a greater part as his mother inevitably does less and less. I mean, is there, are we watching here, Roya, a kind of gradual changeover of responsibilities? Are we being introduced to the new era? I think we've been seeing that sometime, David. I think we have been in an era of transition for a while. As you mentioned, we saw it at the State Open of Parliament with Prince of Wales and Prince William open on their behalf. We saw it at Commonwealth Day service back in March, and we're seeing it here today, a last minute change, the Prince of Wales stepping in and representing Her Majesty, and acknowledging the physical limitations of a 96 year old monarch, and I think we will see that more and more going forwards. Prince William there talking to the Archbishop of York, maybe wishing him good luck with his sermon. <laughs> and the sacrist, Robert Copeland and Robert Kozak, the sixth centre at the end of the line.
Well, there's a very cheerful atmosphere here, even though Her Majesty the Queen's not here, which is perhaps a disappointment to many. It seems a very easy, friendly atmosphere. I mean, these are occasions when I wish I was a lip reader, because they seem <laughs> well, to be having I... such a such a sort of nice, friendly chat before they come in about, I don't know what, what the service is going to be or what's happening. I suspect we will see some coverage in tomorrow's papers of lip readers <laughs> from what the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are saying, and perhaps what Sussex have been saying in our coverage. Know, but yes, they, that they, would be very intrusive. <laughs> they look very cheerful, yeah, despite do. Her Majesty's absence. I think this this greeting may go on for some time because the service is not yet due to start for several minutes. So whether they're aware of this, I don't know. But there's wonderful music to listen to. And the bells pealing. And the Archbishop of York, who used to be Bishop of Reading before he took up his post as Archbishop of York. Good view of the coats there, heavy coats, the scarlet. They've lasted well, made in 1935 for George V's. Silver Jubilee. Now, they seem, I think, to be moving into position, and the sign that the service is about to begin will be a fanfare from the state trumpeters of the Household Cavalry. Processions led by the Berger, the Crucifer, the St. Christian's Center, the assistant chaplain, the Berger, and then the ecumenical dignitaries that we saw earlier on, members of Christian churches. There are members of other faiths here, but this is a Christian service. Cardinal Nichols at the back there in the Scarlet in the Roman Catholic Church and following him a verger and then the prebendaries, the archdeacons. So, so long this procession that they're Starts off while they're still chatting at the back, waiting to go.
we come together in this cathedral church today to offer God thanks and praise for the reign of Her Majesty the Queen, and especially for her 70 years of faithful and dedicated service. As we gather from communities across her realm and the Commonwealth of Nations, we rejoice in the diverse and varied lives of all those whom she serves, and in the beauty and abundance of the world in which we live. Inspired by words and music, we pray that God will continue to bless and guide Her Majesty, and that we may all receive grace to honour life and to live in harmony with one another. And we continue to pray for those whose lives are marred by conflict, suffering and tragedy, and mindful of the call of God to look to the needs of others, we commit ourselves afresh to caring for our world and all for whom it is home, striving always to seek out and nurture that which is good in people and in all creation. All these are thanksgivings, prayers, and pledges we offer to God through the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.